Section 10. Stalinism, a product of the old society. Russia took the greatest leap in history, a leap in which the most progressive forces of the country found their expression. Now, in the current reaction, the sweep of which is proportionate to the sweep of the revolution, backwardness is taking its revenge. Stalinism embodies this reaction. The barbarism of old Russian history upon new social bases seems yet more disgusting since it is constrained to conceal itself in a hypocrisy unprecedented in history. The liberals and the social democrats of the West, who were constrained by the Russian Revolution into doubt about their rotted ideas, now experienced a fresh influx of courage. The moral gangrene of the Soviet bureaucracy seemed to them the rehabilitation of liberalism. Stereotyped copybooks are drawn out into the light. Every dictatorship contains the seeds of its own degeneration. Only democracy guarantees the development of personality, and so forth. The contrasting of democracy and dictatorship, including in the given case a condemnation of socialism in favor of the bourgeois regime, stuns one from the point of view of theory by its illiterateness and unscrupulousness. The Stalinist pollution, a historical reality, is counterpoised to democracy, a suprahistorical abstraction. But democracy also possesses a history in which there is no lack of pollution. In order to characterize the Soviet bureaucracy, we have borrowed the names of Thermidor and Bonapartism from the history of bourgeois democracy because, let this be known to the retarded liberal doctrinaires, democracy came into the world not at all through the democratic road. Only a vulgar mentality can satisfy itself by chewing on the theme that Bonapartism was the natural offspring of Jacobinism, the historical punishment for infringing upon democracy, and so on. Without the Jacobin retribution upon feudalism, bourgeois democracy would have been absolutely unthinkable. Contrasting to the concrete historical stages of Jacobinism, Thermidor, Bonapartism, the idealized abstraction of democracy, is as vicious as contrasting the pains of childbirth to a living infant. Stalinism, in turn, is not an abstraction of dictatorship, but an immense bureaucratic reaction against the proletarian dictatorship in a backward and isolated country. The October Revolution abolished privileges, waged war against social inequality, replaced the bureaucracy with self-government of the toilers, abolished secret diplomacy, strove to render all social relationship completely transparent. Stalinism reestablished the most offensive forms of privileges, imbued inequality with a provocative character, strangled mass self-activity under police absolutism, transformed administration into a monopoly of the Kremlin oligarchy, and regenerated the fetishism of power in forms that absolute monarchy dared not dream of. Social reaction in all forms is constrained to mask its real aims. The sharper the transition from revolution to reaction, the more the reaction is dependent upon the traditions of the revolution. That is, the greater its fear of the masses, the more it is forced to resort to mendacity and frame-up in the struggle against the representatives of the revolution. Stalinist frame-ups are not a fruit of Bolshevik amoralism. No, like all important events in history, they are a product of the concrete social struggle, and the most perfidious and severest of all at that the struggle of a new aristocracy against the masses that raised it to power. 
Verily, boundless intellectual and moral obtuseness is required to identify the reactionary police morality of Stalinism with the revolutionary morality of the Bolsheviks. Lenin's party has long ceased to exist. It was shattered between inner difficulties and world imperialism. In its place rose the Stalinist bureaucracy, transmissive mechanism of imperialism. The bureaucracy substituted class collaboration for the class struggle on the world arena, social patriotism for internationalism. In order to adapt the ruling party to the tasks of reaction, the bureaucracy renewed its composition through executing revolutionists and recruiting careerists. Every reaction regenerates, nourishes, and strengthens those elements of the historic past which the revolution struck but which it could not vanquish. The methods of Stalinism bring to the highest tension, to a culmination and at the same time to an absurdity, all those methods of untruth, brutality, and baseness which constitute the mechanics of control in every class society, including also that of democracy. Stalinism is a single clot of all monstrosities of the historical state, its most malicious caricature and disgusting grimace. When the representatives of old society puritanically counterpoise a sterilized democratic abstraction to the gangrene of Stalinism, we can, with full justice, recommend to them, as to all of old society, that they fall enamored of themselves in the warped mirror of Soviet Thermidor. True, the GPU far surpasses all other regimes in the nakedness of its crimes. But this flows from the immense amplitude of events shaking Russia under the influence of world imperialist demoralization. Among the liberals and radicals, there are not a few individuals who have assimilated the methods of the materialist interpretation of events and who consider themselves Marxists. This does not hinder them, however, from remaining bourgeois journalists, professors, or politicians. A Bolshevik is inconceivable, of course, without the materialist method in the sphere of morality, too. But this method serves him not solely for the interpretation of events, but rather for the creation of a revolutionary party of the proletariat. It is impossible to accomplish this task without complete independence from the bourgeoisie and their morality. Yet bourgeois public opinion actually now reigns in full sway over the official workers' movement. From William Green in the United States, Leon Bloom and Maurice Therese in France, to Garcia Oliver in Spain. In this fact, the reactionary character of the present period reaches its sharpest expression. A revolutionary Marxist cannot begin to approach his historical mission without having broken morally from bourgeois public opinion and its agencies in the proletariat. For this, moral courage of a different caliber is required than that of opening wide one's mouth at meetings and yelling, Down with Hitler! Down with Franco! It is precisely this resolute, completely thought out, inflexible rupture of the Bolsheviks from conservative moral philosophy, not only of the big but of the petty bourgeoisie, which mortally terrorizes democratic phrasemongers, drawing room prophets, and lobbying heroes. From this is derived their complaints about the amoralism of the Bolsheviks. Their identification of bourgeois morals with morals in general can best of all perhaps be verified at the extreme left wing of the petty bourgeoisie, precisely in the centrist parties of the so-called London Bureau. Since this organization recognizes the program of proletarian revolution, our disagreements with it seem, at first glance, secondary. Actually, their recognition is valueless because it does not bind them to anything. 
They recognize the proletarian revolution as the Kantians recognize the categorical imperative. That is, as a holy principle, but not applicable to daily life. In the sphere of practical politics, they unite with the worst enemies of the revolution, reformists and Stalinists, for the struggle against us. All their thinking is permeated with duplicity and falsehood. If the centrists, according to a general rule, do not raise themselves to imposing crimes, it is only because they forever remain in the byways of politics. They are, so to speak, petty pickpockets of history. For this reason, they consider themselves called upon to regenerate the workers' movement with a new morality. At the extreme left wing of this left fraternity stands a small and politically completely insignificant grouping of German emigres who publish the paper Neuer Weg, The New Road. Let us bend down lower to listen to these revolutionary indicters of Bolshevik amoralism. In a tone of ambiguous pseudo-praise, the newer Veg proclaims that the Bolsheviks are distinguished advantageously from other parties by their absence of hypocrisy. They openly declare what others quietly apply in fact, that is, the principle, the end justifies the means. But according to the convictions of newer Veg, such a bourgeois precept is incompatible with a healthy socialist movement. Lying and worse are not permissible means of struggle, as Lenin still considered. The word still evidently signifies that Lenin did not succeed in overcoming his delusions only because he failed to live until the discovery of the new road. In the formula lying and worse, worse evidently signifies violence, murder, and so on. Since under equal conditions, violence is worse than lying, and murder the most extreme form of violence. We thus come to the conclusion that lying, violence, and murder are incompatible with a healthy socialist movement. What, however, is our relation to revolution? Civil war is the most severe of all forms of war. It is unthinkable not only without violence against tertiary figures, but, under contemporary technique, without murdering old men, old women, and children. Must one be reminded of Spain? The only possible answer of the friends of Republican Spain sounds like this. Civil war is better than fascist slavery. But this completely correct answer merely signifies that the end, democracy or socialism, justifies, under certain conditions, such means as violence and murder. Not to speak about lies. Without lies, war would be as unimaginable as a machine without oil. In order to safeguard even the session of the Cortes, February 1st, 1938, from fascist bombs, the Barcelona government several times deliberately deceived journalists and their own population. Could it have acted in any other way? Whoever accepts the end, victory over Franco, must accept the means, civil war with its wake of horrors and crimes. Nevertheless, lying and violence in themselves warrant condemnation? Of course, even as does the class society which generates them. A society without social contradictions will naturally be a society without lies and violence. However, there is no way of building a bridge to that society save by revolutionary, that is, violent, means. The revolution itself is a product of class society, and of necessity bears its traits. From the point of view of eternal truths, revolution is of course anti-moral. But this merely means that the idealist morality is counter-revolutionary, that is, in the service of the exploiters. Civil war, will perhaps respond the philosopher caught unawares, is however a sad exception. 
but in peaceful times, a healthy socialist movement should manage without violence and lying. Such an answer, however, represents nothing less than a pathetic evasion. There is no impervious demarcation between peaceful class struggle and revolution. Every strike embodies in an unexpanded form all the elements of civil war. Each side strives to impress the opponent with an exaggerated representation of its resoluteness to struggle and its material resources. Through their press, agents, and spies, the capitalists labor to frighten and demoralize the strikers. From their side, the workers' pickets, where persuasion does not avail, are compelled to resort to force. Thus, lie and worse are an inseparable part of the class struggle even in its most elementary form. It remains to be added that the very conception of truth and lie was born of social contradictions.